This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Romulo Lolato, K-State Wheat Production Specialist, begins today's show with information about the variability of wheat harvest in Kansas. Continuing the show is K-State Extension Entomology Associate in Garden City, Anthony Zukoff, discussing fall armyworms. We are also joined by USDA's Rod Bain and United Sorghum Checkoff Program's Norma Ritz-Johnson to talk about developing value-added products. Finishing today's show is K-State horticulture entomologist Raymond Cloyd. He says bagworms, Japanese beetle, squash bugs, blister beetles, and two spotted spider mites are all currently active. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Thursday show with an update on how wheat harvest is going in Kansas. And to give us that update, we're joined with K-State Wheat Production Specialist, Romulo Lovato. Romulo, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Shelby. Thank you, and I appreciate the invitation to be here. And Romulo, I talked with you during the wheat tour across Kansas. And so you, during that time period, kind of gave an overview of how the growing season was going. Can we have a quick refresher on what we are seeing during that time period? So if we were having this conversation a couple of months ago, right, which is, I think, what you're referring to, uh, definitely the, the story was a little bit different, right? The crop just went through so many challenges this growing season. Starting last fall with many parts of the state not even getting rainfall for the crop to emerge, and so not even getting a, a crop established back in the fall, especially southwest Kansas and in other parts of the state as well. Then over the winter, right, we had some extremely cold temperatures that resulted in winter kill in particular in the north central part of the state. So pretty much from that Salina region north and uh, and west, probably until Phillipsburg or so, we were seeing a lot of winter kill just from the very cold temperatures that we had in December there, probably a week or 10 days where temperatures got to the negative every single night, right? And so the crop couldn't really handle that very well. Not much in terms of diseases or anything like that, but really after the, the winter, we had a couple of freeze events during the spring that hurt the crop in central Kansas as well. And from there, we had extreme heat event in early May that also uh, took a toll on the crop's yield potential. This is the snapshot that we were having exactly two months ago in mid-May. The crop was drought stressed because there was virtually no moisture since the fall, whenever that moisture even, even came in the fall. Then uh, winter kill and freeze damages and heat stress. So that was the situation that we were a couple months back. And we think from there on, the conditions absolutely improved. It would be hard to decrease from what, where we were at that point in time. But at that point in time, we were even considering if the crop would reach maybe 20 bushels per acre at the state level. It is quite incredible how well we can recover given the right conditions during that grain filling period, which is kind of what happened this year, right? So starting there in around May 15th or so, uh, we had a few cold fronts come by. Temperatures were mild late May and early June. And there was uh, some precipitation events here and there as well. And that really saved the crop in many conditions. So crops that were probably going to be abandoned, which a lot of the crop was abandoned around the state. But of the remaining crop, uh, many of the fields that were going to be abandoned were not because of those conditions during grain field. Maybe they yielded 15, 20 bushels per acre. And fields that had an okay condition improved quite a bit, right? Those cool and moist conditions that we had during late May, early June, really helped the crop to have some sort of yield potential after the extremely stressful growing season that it went through. What is wheat harvest looking like currently in Kansas? Well, I can say that uh, we are delayed. It's uh, July 20th, and as of today, we're probably roughly 80% done with wheat harvest in the state, whereas in a normal year, we would be 95 plus percent. We should already be wrapping everything up. The main reason why we are delayed, I guess, a couple of things. So those cool and moist conditions that I mentioned late May and throughout the month of June there, they delayed the crop cycle, right? So perhaps a region that usually will be harvesting on June 15th, it wasn't until June 20th or so that they got started. So we had natural delay on harvest 
just because of those cool and moist conditions that we had during the grain filling period. So that was one of the reasons. And that's a good reason for delaying harvest is because it's during a part of the season when wheat is actually putting a lot of yield in those heads. The other reason why we have harvest delayed is perhaps not a really good one, which is just because we have been having many scattered rainfall events that have been holding us back. If we just had an inch of rainfall last night, well, we can't really get in the field for another couple of days especially if conditions continue to be misty and fairly cool and moist, it might be five days before we can get into that field again. And so when those five days come about, maybe we'll have another rain shower. So that has really, really been dragging the harvest along for much longer than it should be. And even in our own research program, we have plots all over the state, so whatever we could get done before around June 30th or so. And then we had probably a 10-day interval that we didn't do anything. And then we got back to it. And now we got delayed again. Just uh, as of uh, of last night, we were harvesting Phillipsburg and we got rain out again. And so we put that on pause and we'll, we'll wrap that up probably later this week, hopefully. What we're experiencing across the state is the reality for all of the wheat growers as well. Just rainfall events holding things back and not allowing us to really get into the field and, and get the wheat harvest out. With that, there come some issues as well, right? We start getting anxious because what are some of the main issues that we have been facing, I guess, this season and how does this rainfall makes it worse? Well, I described those conditions that the crop was as of mid-May. Very, very tough conditions, very thin stands. And with that, a lot of weeds just started to emerge. And pre-harvest weed issues were very prevalent across the entire state. So many growers having to spray some type of burn down herbicide. And then you have the pre-harvest interval off that herbicide, right? And so that was one of the prevalent issues that we had was just like weedy conditions at harvest. Those late rainfall showers also brought some flush of late dealers being produced by the crop. So perhaps the early dealers may have been ready to harvest. But we have just a flush of late tillers coming down. So what do you do? Do you wait until they are ready as well so you can actually cut and and try to make that part of your grain yield, especially in a tough season as we have had? Or do you just consider that they're not going to be too productive and just cut it and increase your moisture content in the grain that you're harvesting, right? So that that creates a, a whole set of challenges on itself as well. And in the cases where those tillers are not contributing to, to grain yields, we call them suckers. They're just sucking energy from the plant and not allowing that energy to be put into the grains that are actually going to be harvested. Rainfall coming down in a crop that is ready to harvest poses its own set of challenges as well beyond these weeds and beyond late produced tillers, which is decreases in test weight. If we think of the grain as it is ready to harvest, it's a structure where there's a lot of cells that are just packed together. Once it gets wet, those cells, they increase in size. And whenever it dries again, they never get as compact as they were before. And so you're decreasing the density of that kernel. And test weight is another way that we say density pretty much, right, is a, is a pounds per volume. And so essentially, you are decreasing the test weight of that grain every time that we have a rain event come by. Again, very simple. Rain babs moisture. It expands and it never shrinks back to the same size, and so it is less dense. So these rainfalls that we have been having, they definitely have taken a toll on the test weight of the crop around the state. And in more extreme cases, they can lead to pre-harvest sprouting as well, right? So they can lead to cases in which the grain just gets so much moisture, and perhaps it's a variety that doesn't have much dormancy on that seed, that starts sprouting in the head. And that's a big concern as well. Depending on the amount that the grain is going to get docked, and it's just another nightmare for growers to work with. Beyond all of these things that we're talking about, there's just issues of hail damage. Sometimes I think, well, yeah, it's bringing moisture and, and moisture is going to be good for the other crops that we are growing, summer crops. Perhaps not if this moisture comes as hail, right? And it was a pity to see because across the entire state, the, the best looking wheat that I've seen this season was northwest Kansas. So pretty much from Kobe west and north all the way to the corners there with, uh, with Nebraska and Colorado. I have been keeping an eye and that region got two or three hailstorms here recently. So the best looking wheat in the state with the best yield potential may just not be there anymore because of some of these hail storms that went by this these last few days here. So again, we love precipitation, we love rainfall, we need it to grow our crops. Unfortunately this year it came at a very bad timing for the most part. 
which is at harvest time, right? And so really making a season that had already a number of challenges with drought and winter kill and freeze damage and heat stress and all of the, those challenges that we mentioned before, making it even more challenging, which unfortunately there's not much we can do other than wait to see so we don't get some hailstorm on, on that crop and wait for things to dry out and go ahead and, and cut it in the hopes that we didn't see much losses in test weight or in pre-harvest sprout. You mentioned that you were hoping that Kansas was able to get 20 bushels. What are you seeing with quality and yield for Kansas? What I'm seeing is variability. I think that that's the word that describes everything. I've, I've heard reports from growers from uh, just above the insurance cut there, seven, eight bushels per acre, all the way to over 100 bushels per acre. And so it has been such a large variability in yield conditions, just depending if that field was lucky enough to get an extra shower or two during the season. I think we will be higher than that 20 that I mentioned before. Maybe we're going to be on that low 30s in terms of ballpark and what I'm hearing and so on. But just a huge amount of variability getting us to that low 30s in terms of yield. Test weights have also been quite variable, you know, with reports from 55, 56, all the way to 63 plus pounds per bushel there. So, so extreme variability on test weight with a decreasing trend now towards the end. So we started the harvest with decent test weights, but then it has been going down again because of these rainfall events that we have had. Same thing on protein. I've heard from as low as 7% to as high as 15%. So just a huge variability in all the three components, yield, test weight, and protein that have been driven by variabilities in growing conditions and here uh, later a variability in rainfall conditions when those fields are ready to harvest and getting rained on. That was K-State Wheat Production Specialist Romulo Lolato. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. We're tuned back into Agriculture Today, and we continue our show now discussing an insect that can be found in crop fields, however, possibly in homeowners' lawns. And to talk about it, we have Kansas State University Extension Entomology Associate from Garden City, Anthony Zukoff. Anthony, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And so the pest we are going to talk about today is a fall armyworm. And so before we discuss all the ways to control it or manage it and scout it out, what does it look like? Right. So the fall armyworm as an adult is kind of a drab looking brownish gray moth. The stage at which it's damaging, though, is good to know how to identify is it's a caterpillar that has kind of a orangish, very mottled head with a prominent Y marking on the front of its face. So that's distinct. And then its body is going to have several, you know, striations running down the side with a various, you know, dark pigment dots and stuff like that. The color of the caterpillar can vary quite a bit, but that Y on the front of its head is pretty distinctive. And so more concerned about it when it's a caterpillar than when it's a moth. Correct. The caterpillar is what's doing the damage. What damage is this caterpillar doing in fields? So fall armyworm caterpillars, they are primarily responsible for defoliation on a lot of different uh, host plants, which includes several of our crops in Kansas. And as you mentioned, turf and landscaping plants. One of the biggest risks this caterpillar poses, though, is uh, feeding uh, on grain. So especially like heading milo, they could do a lot of damage in the developing heads. And that's uh, usually the biggest concern with this pest. How do people need to go look for this out in their fields? Right. So we have the moths trickling into the state now. As soon as the moths show up here, uh, they're ready to reproduce and lay eggs. And those eggs are going to be hatching. And what folks need to do is when they're getting out scouting, uh, so if you have, for instance, corn in the whorl stage or milo in the whorl stage, you're going to look in, in the middle of that whorl and look for feeding damage. That'll look really ragged, a lot of a lot of holes usually, and a lot of caterpillar frass. So that's one way to scout when plants are vegetative. When you have a crop like a milo that's heading out, you want to go out to the field and take a bucket and just bang those heads into the bucket and see if you could dislodge caterpillars. And so you're going to be looking for caterpillars in the heads that way. And you mentioned trickling into state, so they're not here all year round? Correct. This is so a unique feature about this particular pest is that it cannot overwinter in Kansas, cannot survive winters. And so this pest migrates from the Gulf Coast every season up through Texas, and the adult moths enter Kansas and our neighboring states, and they begin to reproduce. So yeah, they, they migrate in and they usually start showing up the end of June, early July, and we're just now starting to get them showing up now. 
And if they showed up in producers' fields last year, are they more likely to show up again this year? No, not necessarily. The fact that it's migratory, it's it's really influenced a lot by weather patterns in Texas um, and weather patterns in general as it migrates north and gets into the state. So with this migratory pest, we never know when exactly it's going to uh, arrive, and we don't know where exactly it's going to arrive at all either. So uh, just because you might have had issues last year does not mean you're necessarily going to have issues this year. If people are seeing this fall army worm or think they're starting to see it, what are the threshold and control methods for taking care of it? Yes, yeah, so there's several crops that we have that can impact um, going back to Milo, the threshold for Milo is uh, one to two caterpillars per head. So every for every caterpillar that's in that head, you could get a yield loss of 5%. So that could add up very quickly. Uh, and, you know, corn is usually not very much at risk uh, because the moths, the caterpillars are active when corn is usually vegetative. Uh, there are published thresholds for vegetation damage for corn and sorghum. But they usually are never mat, uh, actually uh, achieved here in Kansas. And that's basically if you have 75% of your field that's showing defoliation and active caterpillars, then that might be grounds to spray the field. But again, that rarely happens. And also those plants can really tolerate some feeding and without uh, impacting the yield. Anthony, as we were discussing the fall armyworm, is there other important information that people and producers may want to keep in mind when thinking about this insect? So another important thing to know about this pest is that fall armyworm has two full generations in Kansas each year. And depending on the weather, we could get a partial third one before the, la- the first frost of the season. But this is important to know because the first generation is usually very small, uh, and not very abundant in the landscape. And so those caterpillars will be more spread out and plants usually don't get too much damage or pressure. It's the second generation that can be really important to uh, pay attention to because that's where we start getting risks to seedling crops in the fall and also heading milo. So sometimes even if the plants are looking a little rough, it's okay just to hold out and they should recuperate that loss. Correct. And then, you know, when we get later into the summer, early fall, alfalfa and wheat can be at risk, you know, seedling alfalfa, seedling wheat. And so folks want to scout those fields if there's fall armor activity in the area because it only takes one to two or three caterpillars per foot to uh, wipe out seedling alfalfa and, and wheat. And from your work in this agronomy e-update and it's mentioned in the Crop Insects of Kansas, which I'll link in today's show notes, there's a part in there that says it will target alfalfa last. So maybe not the top concern? Right. Yeah, it just depends on when the caterpillars arrive, what the weather's doing, because as soon as the weather starts getting cool, um, the caterpillar is going to get very, very much less active. And as soon as we have a first frost, those caterpillars are going to die. Um, and so if we have good late, you know, fall where the alfalfa is happy and growing really fast, caterpillar is probably not going to be a problem at all. Taking a little bit of the bigger scope, not just in crops, but also in homeowners' lawns, is it really a concern there? It can be some years. So this pest causes isolated problems pretty much every year in Kansas somewhere. Uh, there are years, however, where there's major outbreaks, like in 2020, uh, we had a huge fall armor outbreak across the whole state and in neighboring states, and folks were losing their lawns. There are so many caterpillars. So it can it can be a problem for homeowners and the landscaping, but not every year. Usually it's going to be very small, isolated feeding damage. So something just to keep an eye out on. And speaking of tracking insects, you've recently come up with kind of a network to help make that easier across Kansas. Correct. Yeah. So the insect, uh, the Kansas Insect Trapping Network is uh, started its first year this year. And this is something we hope to go into in many, many years. And we're basically using pheromones and bucket traps to monitor several key pests in, in Kansas. And right now it's several moths. So the fall army was one of those pests that we're going to be tracking long term now. And the idea is that over time we could get an idea of usually when it arrives and how abundant it is in the state. So maybe in the future we could predict this might be an outbreak year, for instance, with that that long-term data that we're collecting. While we're talking about this Kansas Insect Trapping Network, and specifically right now talking about fall armyworms, this network tracks more pests than just the fall armyworm. Correct. So it also includes right now army cutworms, which is a pest of a, a few crops in the spring and in the fall. We're also tracking western bean cutworm, which is a, a can be a significant pest of corn in western Kansas uh, this time of year. 
That was Kansas State University Extension Entomology Associate located in Garden City, Anthony Zukoff. The agronomy e-update he wrote concerning fall armyworm, I will link in today's show notes, which as always, you can find on actoday.net. Before we cut to a short break now, we're going to be joined by USDA's Rod Bain and United Sorghum Checkoff Program's Norma Ritz-Johnson as they discuss how the sorghum industry's checkoff program uses both its marketing and research arms to develop and promote value-added products for consumers, especially those overseas. The growth of sorghum in the global export market. It is part of the mission of the United Sorghum Checkoff Program, one of the grower-led checkoff programs with USDA oversight, emphasizing research and marketing of their specific commodity. The world over the past several years has discovered sorghum, and certainly our work at the producer-funded sorghum checkoff focuses heavily on expanding markets, particularly higher value markets that bring premiums for producers. And Norma Rich Johnson of United Sorghum says this comes about via value added as well as partnership. On the global front, we partner very closely with the U.S. Grains Council. Certainly, they have great relationships all over the world. We have maintained and been able to establish some really good relationships all over the world. And it's just really a matter of being able to grow enough sorghum to fill those needs around the world, as well as to meet the ever-expanding end uses for sorghum here domestically. What does that value-added look like for both the sorghum industry and consumers? One example provided by Rich Johnson. Increasing a bit every single year in terms of what percent of the sorghum crop goes into pet food. We at the Sorghum Checkoff used to do a pretty good job of keeping up with the pet foods that included sorghum so we could brag about them and even list those on our website for consumers to look at. And we're having a really good problem right now in terms of not being able to keep up with what's out there in terms of the pet food industry that includes sorghum. Sorghum is considered a novel or ancient grain ingredient, according to Rich Johnson, which drives consumer interest. And it is absolutely a market for sorghum that brings premium for producers. The value-added priority has long been part of United Sorghum's mission area since its formation in 2008 as a checkoff program. Some of that is breeding marketable traits, such as high protein, looking at characteristics and traits such as leucine. So anything that we can do where we're conducting research to meet the demands that are out there in terms of what the world is looking for in sorghum, that's something that we're investing in as well. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. That was USDA's Rod Bain and United Sorghum Checkoff Program's Norma Ritz-Johnson as they discussed marketing and research to develop and promote value-added products. I will link the Sorghum Checkoff's website in today's show notes on actday.net. And as always, if you're coming to your destination or have missed past shows, you can find those on our website. We're cutting to a short break now, but when we return, we're going to be joined by Raymond Cloyd as he discusses insects homeowners are seeing around their house. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Shelby Farner, I'm Jeff Wickman. K-State horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd says that bagworms, the Japanese beetle, squash bugs, blister beetles, and two spotted spider mites are all currently active. Raymond, as usual, we kind of like to start off by talking about bagworms and what are we seeing right now. Okay, Jeff, right now what we're seeing is the bagworms are increasing in size, but the, it's the bags, the caterpillars are inside, and it's getting close to being too late to apply the uh, products we recommend like spinosad and the BTK, which is also called Bacillus thuringiensis curistachy. Now you have to start using some of the more heavier chemicals like the pyrethroids, and those will kill them, but they also impact pollinators and beneficial insects and mites. So that's the trade-off. There's also hand removal if it's practical and put them in a, a container of soapy water. You need to kill them. Don't throw them in your tote after taking them out because the caterpillars will move around. But right now, uh, what I've been hearing and seeing is the bags are, are getting bigger, over half an inch, some an inch, and it's getting too late to use the common stomach poisons we recommend early. And you have to knock the populations back or they will uh, they will defoliate a plant. Also, Japanese beetles, they're starting to be more active? Oh, Japanese beetles are, are all over the place, Jeff, right now. I mean, they're feeding, you name it, roses, crepe myrtle, linden, cannas. They're all over the place. And 
for the adults, it's very unfortunate that we don't have any selective materials, but you have to use products like Carbril or 7 or some of the pyrethroids. And you don't want to apply those when the bees are out because they will kill the bees. So make your applications early morning or late evening. And you're going to have to make more than one application because the adult Japanese beetles can fly four to five miles. Do not use the Japanese beetle traps because they'll lure Japanese beetles into the area, especially if you're in an urban area. So don't use those at all. You can handpick them. They're very easy to handpick in the morning because they're very lethargic. And just put a container of soapy water in the bottom. You'll collect them and kill them. But if again, if you do have questions regarding Japanese beetle adult manager, contact your county extension agent or our office at the Department of Entomology at Kansas State University. Squash bugs active as well? Oh, squash bugs are out too. The adults, the males, the females have made as eggs are laid and we're seeing nymphs and they are feeding on uh, squash plants primarily. They are very difficult to control. The key for controlling them is the eggs. If you can squish them or apply a, an oil-based material like a mineral oil or I think neem oil might work, which suffocates them. But everything is on the leaf underside, so you have to get on leaf underside. Now, the nymphs are susceptible to some of the common insecticides that are out there. It's, it's the adults that are very hard to control because they have a very waxy cuticle, which impedes the insecticide from penetrating. So that reduces mortality. But if you don't deal with squash bugs, they can decimate squash plants. They are feed on the leaves, and both the nymphs and the adults will feed on the fruit. A couple of others to cover today, blister beetles and two spotted spider mites. Blister beetles, we're seeing feeding on a chard and some other vegetable crops. There are various types of blister beetles. We have the black blister beetle, the gray blister beetle, and the three-line blister beetle. They have chewing mouth parts, but one of the distinct characteristics is the black fecal material you'll see on the leaves. It's different from caterpillars. It's more strung out and lengthy. They hide during the daytime at the base of plants, but they will feed on a wide variety of vegetable crops at this time of year. Do not handpick them unless you're wearing leather gloves because they will emit a, a material called cantharidin. That's very irritating. If it gets in your eyes, it can cause burning. So be very cautious if you decide to, to hand remove them and put them in a bucket of soapy water and kill them. And then the two-spotted spider mites? Yes, this is the time of year, hot and dry, two-spotted spider mite thrives in those conditions, feeding on tomatoes, uh, yonimus, wide diversity of vegetable and ornamental plants. The eggs, uh, the larvae and the nymphs, are, and the adults and leaf underside. One of the one of first recommendations is we use a, a high-pressure water spray or a forceful water spray to dislodge them. They won't come back. They don't like the moisture. If you do that routinely about twice a week, say an anonymous bush or a plant, that will reduce uh, an infestation and reduce an outbreak. You can use a miticide. There are soaps, insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils that are contact that will provide mortality of two-spotted spider mite, yes. But everything is on the leaf underside. So you have to get thorough coverage in order to kill as many of the spider mites, as well as we talked about squash bug eggs too, as possible by getting on leaf underside. That's K-State Horticultural Entomologist Raymond Cloyd. Again, for more information, contact your local extension office. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.